Hi, folks, and welcome back to the Inside the Mix podcast. And in this episode, I am very excited to welcome our guest today, Sunglasses Kid. So, just a bit of a bio here. So, Sunglasses Kid is a London based producer who makes nostalgic vocal driven pop and instrumentals inspired by the music, fashion, and films of the late 80s and early 90s. He's collaborated with artists and musicians, including Ollie Ride, Jay Diggs, Zach Robinson, Tim Capello, yes, Megan McDuffie, and more. And he's going to share with us the story behind Sunglasses Kid. His experience as a self-taught musician, uh, approach to songwriting and content generation, and his thoughts and reflection on networking in the music industry. And I'm going to breathe now. Uh, Ed, uh, Sunglasses Kid, thanks for joining me. And how are you? I'm good, thank you. I um, don't know how much I'll be able to reflect on networking in the music industry. I'm not even sure what the music industry is now. <laughs> like it's just yeah. a nebulous bunch of people on the internet. Yes, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, we'll, we'll delve into that in a bit, in a bit. But um, no, I love that. That's a great description. I'm going to use that as a quote um, from this. We haven't even. We're only a minute in, and I've got an, a quote already for this. Fantastic. So, what I'd like to start off with is um, life before the sunglasses, kids. So you started mm-hmm. making uh, music or releasing under this sort of moniker back in 2013, and you produced two albums, two EPs, and dozens of singles. That have been featured in commercials, uh, video games, and short films. But can you tell our audience a bit about your sort of musical life before Sunglasses Kid? Where, where did it all begin? Um, I mean, I, I grew up around music. My my mum was a well, was she still is a classically trained pianist, and she was a piano teacher. Though I never received any like piano lessons from her. I think she knew better than to try and teach me because I wasn't the kind of kid that took well to being told what to do. Um, so I was, I grew up around music and heard a lot of it in the house. So it was literally, you know, we'd listen to children learning to play the piano underneath my bedroom. And so I guess that was sort of around me a lot. And then also, I guess my mum was quite an influence in my life in that she, she also was an early adopter of, she bought like, um, like the Korg M1 workstation because she was, she was also doing songwriting and she wanted to be able to record it all in the box. And so she had that. So suddenly there was an M1 in the house, but my first kind of instrument, I suppose, arguably is it an instrument was the drums. So when I was like about 12 or 13, I, um, decided I wanted to play the drums and, um, and then I had a kind of, I suppose my kind of, big moment really was, I mean, this was, this was in the early nineties and I was into, I was drumming like everyone was to kind of rock and all the standard stuff you start doing with drums and Nirvana were kind of big at that time. And I was drumming along to things like Nevermind and all that stuff. And then uh, a boyfriend of my sister's at the time. So a couple of years older than me was a chap who was a percussionist for the Royal Philharmonic. And he, when he was coming visiting my sister on the weekends, he'd give me some drum lessons. And he was really into like expanding my kind of knowledge of other drum styles. And he was very into jazz. And so he introduced me. I have this kind of very vivid memory, which I've told this story on other podcasts of him bringing over Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters album on tape and teaching me to drum along to the, that version of Chameleon that that is on that album, which is a kind of got this very kind of funky bass line that goes bong, 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 bong. And you've got like these, offbeat drums so there was this moment where i suddenly like discovered the offbeat and i think that sort of unlocked this interest for me in in jazz and that sort of stuff as well but it was all kind of happening at the same time as there was a massive like dance explosion in electronic music in the uk like london and the uk was outputting a lot of and manchester places like that the uk we were outputting a lot of dance music at that time as well so i was just jumping around from I listened to my like capital FM radio every day religiously. So I was, and they were always rerunning eighties pop and stuff like that. So I was all around all that around jazz, around dance music, around the keyboards in the house and around drums. So I guess that's where it all sort of started. And I started thinking around trying to make music using the Korg and, and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I was born in 81, so I wasn't around like, loads of gear or computers mm. or anything that was all started coming in and around i guess the early noughties really it started really kind of being accessible to like people and and i again i've, I've told this story i was at i've been i went to film school and, and whilst i was at film school there was a norwegian guy called ingmar who composed all his music to his own films and he was he was a real genius and he had a korg triton and he had um, I can't remember what he used, something like Cube Bass or Cakewalk. Anyway, he hooked me up with a CD 
yeah. of, of software. And <laughs> um, the only thing I could get to make anything, make a sound out of anything was a, was a really early version of Fruity Loops. So it was literally like Fruity Loops version 2.0 or something like that. So I was running Fruity Loops on a, whatever it was, something ridiculous, like a 486 PC at film school. And you, it didn't have a piano roll. I didn't have a keyboard. So it was all, I was making all this sample based stuff and I was getting very into like break beat. And I was into kind of, I, I got really into like DJ shadow and uncle and those sort of acts that were combining kind of orchestral stuff. So it was sort of like the synthesis of everything that I was interested in. There was film music, all that. Um, and that, that's when what I then wanted to kind of go on to do. I had this kind of idea after uni that I was going to try and be a film composer and pursue that. And I, I took it very seriously, although I'm completely self-taught. So I was sort of trying to run before I could walk, jumping into orchestral music, um, before I really knew the basics. And I actually kind of got somewhere with it a bit and I had a kind of what I thought was a really, well, it was a really good chance and it didn't quite come to, come to pass to do work on a video game. And I kind of gave it all up a bit and had this massive hiatus from about like 2004 <laughs> to about 2013, where I just wow. decided to work a regular job. I had this kind of moment where I was like 25, 26, where I was just like, if I carry on fucking around trying to be a musician, I'm going to be this unemployable person who can't get another job because I've never, you know, I've just carried on trying to, if we're looking back, I'm like, I was 24, 25 yeah. going, oh, it's over. <laughs> like, <laughs> and the irony was when I stopped trying to give a sh and stopped giving a shit, something weird kind of happened with people taking an interest in what I was doing. But I, I genuinely, when I started Sunglasses Kit, wasn't trying to make something of it. I was, I did it as a kind of, just as a, as a thing for fun. Yeah. yeah. That's an interesting way you put that there. Cause there's a number of, um, artists that I've interviewed for the podcast and it seems to be that I don't know what it is about this particular sort of style of music in particular but a lot of them do come at it in their like 30s I think there's a there's a number of producers I talk to because I'm in my 30s myself and I didn't start doing it until I was in my 30s and I, I much like you I was in a metal band and um I didn't I, you weren't in a metal band but I was in a band doing music previously and it got to the point where I was like if it was going to happen it would have happened by now and I I want to go do X, Y, Z. So I'm going to knock it on the head for a bit and then come back to it and then come back to it because I enjoy it. And I, that's the reason I want to do it. Kind of like what you said there about the way you started sunglasses kid, just to for the enjoyment of it rather than trying to pursue some sort of goal. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess on the thirties thing, I mean, I'm, I'm actually technically now 40, I just turned 40 last year. So, but I think, I think there's my theory, which I've actually then found articles by other people online echoing my theory is that there's a sort of 30 year cycle of like okay. of, of interest in past decades. So as everyone basically reaches the magic age of about 30 to 35, those people are the decision makers in all cultural institutions. They're the editors, they're the directors, they're the, the music supervisors. They've reached that kind of peak career age or I mean, you're not, not saying you have to be at the peak of your career at 35, but people are in that sort of area of their life. And that's also sort of maybe the age that people start getting nostalgic looking back at their mm. childhood. So right now we're in the eighties cohort that's going to yeah. come off stream and the nineties will come on. I mean, you're already mm. seeing that. I'm already seeing like Y2K nostalgia, people getting nostalgic <laughs> about fucking 2003. <laughs> like, and then you yeah. go, Oh yeah, it was like fucking over. Tw it was like nearly like 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, th I think, but then there's something, so I think there's that like unique kind, there's that kind of 30 year cycle. And then there's also on top of that, I think there's a thing about the eighties being just an interesting, a uniquely interesting genre where it was the sudden explosion of a completely new sound. Like all synthesized sound was just totally new. Is that like the guitar was there for the fifties, the sixties, it were, you know, goes back however long yeah, far yeah. back the guitar goes. And then suddenly in the eighties, entirely new, never before heard palette of sounds. Yeah. And given put into the hands of at the time, like incredibly skilled musicians who would all come out of jazz and funk and classical trained. So it was the, it was the, it was the infancy of that stuff that was so in that made, that gave birth to these really interesting sounds. Cause now we've bedded in with 
having computer music for like 30, 40 years, it's all got a bit more business as usual for everyone and and everyone's got it in their hands. But right at the beginning of the eighties, you had like these incredibly skilled musicians suddenly being given this whole new palette of sound to play with. So that's what I think it musically is interesting about the eighties and why I guess it appeals to me as a genre. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. And I think I've noticed with the 90s nostalgia, that's, as you mentioned there, that is slowly creeping in, what with the aesthetic of it as well. I was chatting to my girlfriend the other day about, um, I saw something, some person on TV, and I was like, that that, that look itself there is very 90s. And mm. even in my own productions, I'm, I've noticed in elements of the 90s now creeping in, in particular with sort of like the uh, the house style pianos and, and these, these sort of like these trance chords that I'm bringing in and stuff as well. Yeah. And it's certainly creeping. I'd be intrigued to know what the noughties is going to look like when that comes around. Because I remember the noughties and I was big into new <laughs> metal in the noughties. So that would be interesting and well, how it, that's perceived. I mean, it all depends on what everyone, what every, every, it's part of an era people want to channel. Mm. If, if they're going to do nostalgic music, they're going to go back to an era. It's like, well, which bit of the era? Because it's, it's true. You know, if you, if you look at synthwave and say, well, it's it's channeling it's it's sort of weird because it's sort of channeling this very specific part of the 80s and also it's kind of invented this sound that didn't quite exist but is all feels like it did which is a sort of it's a hybrid of like film score because there's a lot of score influence in synthwave if you listen yeah. to like like i don't consider myself to make typical synthwave i make 80s inspired kind of pop um, so I'm probably more in the synth pop kind of category than, than t the pure, pure synth wave, though everyone would argue about what is, what is that genre. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's, it's clearly taken an influence from the sounds of film scores from like Marauder and Carpenter and people like that. And then it's chucked in a bit of sort of house and electronic, other kind of electronic music. And it's, it's kind of birthed this, this sort of sound. But it's like, well, that was one era of the 80s. It's like people were still making jazz in the 80s. Yeah, people were yeah. still making rock, rock in the 80s. So it's it's like, we're not just talking about any old 80s. There's like this specific slice of the 80s that we've all decided to kind of channel a bit with with the synth, well, the synthwave genre has decided to channel that a bit. Yeah. I suppose having been doing this and releasing this music since 2013 and, in, and as you mentioned having listened to your records a lot as well and i know there is that more synth pop element rather than sort of synth wave and it kind of and it, it fluctuates a bit do you think i'm only i've only been in really entrenched in in the synth realm as it were for the past two or three years do you think it's more popular now than it has been because it seems from my perspective very popular oh it's, i mean it's, massive i mean when i when i started making Sunglasses Kid was just a, this bit of fun I was having on SoundCloud. But like the, you know, the origin story that most people have, at least my <laughs> fuck generation, <laughs> this, kind of, this old far into synthwave now, like, I guess I'm, I'm considered like a second, maybe a second or third, depending on who you ask, generation of synthwave musician. Mm. With like the first generation arguably being the sort of Valerie Collective guys like college and um, electric youth and people like that, right? And when that everyone has, you know, most of our, our my kind of gen has the same story of of talking about seeing the movie Drive, yeah, hearing the soundtrack, getting inspired, particularly Kavinsky. I think Kavinsky's, you know, Night Call mm -hmm. was the track, and then going on a kind of rabbit hole. And I think collectively across the planet, all these bedroom producers thought they were the only person doing it. <laughs> and then they all found each other on, on SoundCloud. But where I, where I kind of tangented off was I was, whilst I liked the kind of dark cinematic elements of like Kavinsky, I think I'd slightly had enough of spending all that time in a dark cinematic world because I'd had my fill of it and got irritated with it with film music or trying to make film music. And so I wanted to just do something for fun. And so what spoke to me was like, the sound of um, Future Cop and Mitch Murder, who were the only real two people doing anything. Like Mitch Murder was the one who was like, suddenly I heard him and I was like, oh my God, this guy's got a little audience and his music so like tongue in cheek and fun and silly and yet really well executed. And yeah, this is really inspiring to just see somebody going out on a limb doing something where they've taken a bit of a, a risk. And like, I, I think like I, 
I never, I, I, I always remember just, I remember specifically saying the one thing I don't want to do is rip off Mitch murder. Cause I'll forever be the poor man's Mitch murder. So all I, <laughs> what I did do was really sort of pay attention to like the atmosphere of what he was doing and the approach he was taking and just the kind of like him being like a pace car for like giving permission to go here's someone out there who has an audience of people who take him seriously. And yet what he's doing is very fun and silly and lighthearted. And, and I thought, Oh yeah, I want to do something like that. That's quite fun, but not, not exactly that. Cause he's got that covered. So I'm, I'm going to yeah. do my own thing. Um, I think the idea of yeah. taking a risk is, is brilliant. And, um, I think in music taking risks is, I, I like that. And I think it's good for progression experimentation. Um, and I've noticed that in your music as well, listening to it, there are those, there, you can hear the different, the fun you're having with your music in particular as well. Um, which we'll come on to in a bit <laughs> when we, when we delve into that, because there's loads of, sure. loads of bits and pieces that I want to, want to pick into. Um, but no, I totally agree with taking risks and, and, um, it's something that I do and it's something I sort of encourage on the podcast with regards to music as well. It's just, yeah, I think take- you've, I think you've got to kind of, I mean, <laughs> It, it's in the same Venn diagram as being original, taking risks. It's like <laughs> the risk-free, the risk-free approach to making music is go study what works, copy it, mm-hmm. put your own spin on it if you want. The and 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 I'm not saying that that doesn't work and that you can't end up by spinning it enough. You might end up coming out with something original that isn't a complete ripoff of the thing you were copying, but true originality is going to force you into the area where you are doing something when you don't know, you've never heard anyone else do it before. Yeah. Like I was doing, I'm not, I'm not like bigging myself up and saying I was being really original or amazing, but there were points with sunglasses kid where I was literally going, I don't have a contemporary reference for what I'm doing. I do not have another person apart from That's like, cool. like I say, Mitch murder. Maybe there is no one else out there going here it's only exists in the actual past. So I'm literally going out and limb going, I know I like it. I hope someone else likes it. And, and, you know, one thing I did for a very brief period in my early twenties was stand up comedy. And oh, wow. It feels like the same. It has the same feeling of going, there's a point where you're going to walk out on the stage and go, I think this is funny. And I will find out if you all agree with me in the next <laughs> 10 seconds. And yeah. it's like that with, with music where you're just going, I, 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 I like the orc hit. I like that yeah. fucking sound from the eighties. I like the fucking slap bass or whatever. I like saxophone. And the thing is, once you've done it and pe- if people then like it, then, then other people can come in afterwards going it, oh, they've, they've kind of gone out and, you know, scouted ahead for us and safely confirmed that yes, you can apparently get away with a bit of sax in a song. Like, or you get, I'm not saying I invented the sax, come up with saxes in songs or anything, but whatever that might be, you know, whatever that thing might be, you know, that's, that's always the way with people like sort of creating a genre or coming up with new ideas. It all seems easy and simple and obvious in hindsight. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think one question I do have off the back of that then. So you mentioned there about taking, we mentioned about taking risks and also it's kind of like you mentioned, you could, you've got a formula, you could, you could adopt the formula and you could paint by numbers for one of a better way of putting it and release that music. And going back to what you said previous to that as well, with regards to the accessibility of music now, cause you've got this whole sound palette before you on, on a 13 inch laptop, potentially. Do you think then that, that there, there is a lot I've, I've asked this question to a number of um, artists, like, because it is so accessible and because you can literally just, you could paint by numbers. Do you think it's quite hard to stand out as, as a new artist then in this, in this synth world? I mean, this, this question gets asked a lot. Everyone, and everyone feel, everyone sort of says, there's too many fucking people at it. <laughs> you know, there's too many fuckers doing it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and, and there's, there's kind of, I think there's sort of, it's a double edged sword, that argument. Cause on one mm. hand you could say, well, back when there were far less people doing it, there was, you know, it was, it was high, higher quality. So it wasn't, it was, you could argue now it's quantity over quality, mm-hmm. but I guess back then to have the sounds that I've got in any sunglasses kitchen, I'm pulling up a VST that's like a fair light 
right? A Fairlight was like 130 grand and only mm. five people in the world had it, like Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder and Jane Child. Yeah. And so on one hand, the gate is like, there's not so the, the entry, the, the entry to what's it? The barrier to entry is, is far lower and everyone can have a go at it. And, but on the, on the other hand, the barrier to entry is low and everyone can have a go at it. I guess, <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess the problem maybe is like when you, when you start thinking about things like the statistics that like make you go, what the fuck is like 20,000 songs a day are uploaded to a Spotify. Mm. Yeah. And so this, this idea, and also that the primary kind of method for like marketing your brand, your mu your music is now social media, whether you like it well, now it's been social media for the last 10 years, yeah. whether you like it or not, you're in the attention game and everyone's now, now with TikTok and all the rest of it, it's gone expert fucking -nential. So you're not just, you're not just, you're not just competing with other musicians. You're competing in the feed with fucking dogs, Cats. dances, <laughs> fail videos. Uh -huh. And there's four seconds maybe, on, you know, to, to catch someone's attention. On the other hand, I only joined TikTok the other week and one of my videos has had like 120,000 plays and really? gained me like 5,000 new followers when I had like 200, like the week I joined. Wow. What was, the, what was versus, the content? It was literally just me jamming on a piano. Um, wow. I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't, I kind of had a go, like a lot of musicians trying to jump onto TikTok and went, got no engagement, went, fuck that. This is a load of bollocks and yeah, gave yeah. up. And then I kind of went back to it because after reading a lot about organic reach and things like that. So, you know, on one hand you could say, well, there's too many fucking people at it. But on the other hand, you could say, well, think about yourself. How far would you be getting with your music? If you didn't have all these tools, these democratized tools in mm -hmm. your hands, I couldn't, I wouldn't have got anywhere. I'd just be some guy going, Oh, if I had 50 grand, I could yeah, buy yeah, yeah. all the equipment I need. And you know, you're so on one hand, you can say TikTok, everyone's fucking doing it or music. Everyone's fucking doing it. But on the other hand, you can say, including me. And I definitely couldn't, you couldn't be doing it without it. So in a way the, the playing fields level just down to like, have you got a good idea or not? Is the song yeah. good? I mean, but then, but then also, you know, you could easily say even good songs don't necessarily get, get you there. But plenty of talented people who get ignored and plenty of talentless people who, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I I, I, I'm with you on that one. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the fact that it is accessible with technology. And then you can, if you've got an idea, you can quickly sketch something out or you can start somewhere and it's accessible to the point where actually, if you think, you know what? I fancy giving this music game a go. I fancy writing some music and I feel inspired. It's so accessible and it's easy to do. And also I find because there are so many people doing it, the, the actual community and the network that uh, I've established through the podcast, for example, is, is amazing because the amount of people doing it. But I think going back to what you said there about social media is, I think social media, as you said, rightly so, is is is, is playing a massive part of you breaking through the noise now. Because you could have, like you say, you could have, be an amazing musician and um, you could have this amazing song. And unfortunately, um, you sort of social media could be the avenue that you need to, to get heard. Um, and I, I'm on TikTok myself and I'm still experimenting with content to see what works. And I'm envious of the fact that you've managed to get that many views and you've only been back on it for two weeks. I've been toiling away and I'm still, still at those like 1000, 2000, if I'm lucky views. So, um, fair play, I mean, man. I mean, TikTok is like, I, I think every, video is like role is like playing the lottery and i think oh. they've rigged it they've rigged it to an extent to feel like a bit like a lottery because and every and it's in their interest to sometimes make somebody you know hit famous because it keeps everyone coming back it's like a lottery yeah. no one ever won the lottery then no one will play it so every so often you need someone to go massive and become a viral star for you to go oh that could be me it's um, like the machines at the arcade isn't it you see somebody yeah. win and you know they're rigged they're gonna exactly. pay out Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like I, I've got, I've got two videos in since I've, since doing that one, one's had like 50,000 and one has had 120,000 views, but then I've got loads of videos that aren't doing anything. And I think that's a known phenomenon, even with TikTokers with like three, 4 million followers, they can, mm -hmm. they're still putting out videos that then get no traction and you're in this arms race. But I think 
the, the, the bigger issue, the bigger thing that it's created is it's, it's made everyone have to become these kind of multi faceted individuals, yeah, isn't it? Like yeah. these kind of your marketer, you're doing all these things. And I mean, already as musicians, as independent musicians or electronic musicians, we're already covering about 11 bases just in the production process alone from like producing, but you're also mixing. You might also be mastering, you're composing, you're doing like jobs that there would have been like a team of people working on that on a song in it back in the you know back in the day and then also not only are you doing that now you're jumping on fucking photoshop you're graphic designing you're marketing you're copywriting you're fucking making videos you're editing mm -hmm. i mean it's highly stressful for like people i mean that's you know you could argue that on one hand the barrier to entry you know is is lower than ever but then to cut through the noise you've got to do that much more and so I think you see the people who rise to the surface they're they're using one of usually about th one of maybe three strategies number one strategy is some sort of an attention grabbing fucking low brow thing like they're yeah, being the lowest hanging fruit really isn't it or they're just doing something shock or whatever they're doing something then you've got people who are like usually trying to do something that's kind of funny or sketches or something like that. And then you've got people who are just trying to be as talented as they can and hoping that that gets cut through. <laughs> like, yeah, <today. laughs> it's, it's crazy. So I've, I've mentioned this a few times and, um, cause I've, I've, on the previous podcast, I've mentioned that I've, I've moved into the world of YouTube shorts and, um, in, in doing so, cause I put this podcast on YouTube every week and the, the, the traction on that isn't as high as it is on Apple podcasts and Spotify and whatnot. Um, but the, the time invested in putting the video onto YouTube, there's quite a lot that goes into it because you've got the post-production behind the interview, you've got the interview, then you've got the bits afterwards. But yeah, I'll put, uh, put something on, on YouTube shorts. Um, and it will, and it's just something silly, like a reaction video that encompasses, I don't know, some Jean-Claude Van Damme, for example, and it got 7,000 views in sort of like two hours. Um, yet, uh, <laughs> one of these podcast episodes, that's an hour long and put all this effort in. I get well, like 10 views in a week. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult because we're, we're in this sort of weird world where we're in a kind of, we're in a sort of cognitive dissonance where on one mm. hand you've got everyone's attention spans drop down to four seconds and, yeah. ev and everyone has followed TikTok suit in going to short form video because no one's got any attention span. But on the other hand, we've seen the biggest boom ever in long form content led by fucking Joe Rogan and yeah, who led the way in f doing four or five hour podcast chats and things like that, that have, have paved the way for this. So there is an appetite for, there's an appetite for that long form stuff as well. Um, I think, I feel like it's, it's almost like right now it's created this, there's no middle ground. Either you're making yeah. really engaging, short, punchy stuff that's just bang, 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 this constant feed of shit, or you're making intense long form. If you sit in the middle, it's not going to work. Yeah. You're, uh, you're in the middle of the road and you're going to get run over. Yeah. That's a really, really, <laughs> I like that. That's a really, really good way of putting it actually. And it sort of echoes my experience of like putting out the short form stuff, which you, you can put together in a matter of five minutes, you know, it's just my phone pointed at a screen. And then I've got the longer format, which is the, the, the video itself. Um, I think if I were to invest more time into the longer formats content with regards to the production and the production quality and stuff, it probably would get more traction and the SEO, but it's as you mentioned earlier, because we're multifaceted and we've got all these different hats that we're wearing, it's finding the time, man. Um, it's, it's, it's insane, which kind of, before I move on to the next bit, one bit, I, one question I did want to ask you, this is sort of going back a bit now to what you mentioned there about, um, your, your music being sort of this, the way you've synthesized all these different genres and, and, and whatnot. You're, you're a self-taught musician. Do you think being self-taught has helped you in terms of your experimentation and the, the direction that you take your music in that you're not sort of rigidly sticking to the formulas that you would get given if you were a taught musician, if that makes sense? I think that really depends on what sort of level of tuition you've received. I think like if you've come from a classic, if you've been classically trained, I think that you can, you, there is the thing of getting hamstrung by all the rules and mm. overthinking things. And, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say being self-taught. I think, I think this whole idea, I hear this argument a lot of like, yeah, man, yeah, I just break the rules, but you know, <laughs> to, uh, to like, 
you, you know, to coin, to use the, uh, yeah. the famous phrase, you've got to know the rules to break the rules. There, yeah, there yeah. is a diff, there is a difference between, um, knowing like you're breaking a rule because you understand the rule. Fundamentally, you understand like, so say like, take like a simple, thing which i won't even be able to articulate musically because i've just lack the musical vocab but I'll, here's a go i'll have a go at trying to explain it is if you've if you're creating suspension with a bass line right dance mm -hmm. music does it all the time classical music everyone does it in different ways so say you've got a three chord like progression and you're gonna s sustain the bass line that's under the th you've got at the root bass note and you don't move that root bass note, it will immediately create suspension. Like it will create a sense of wanting that bass line to resolve along with yeah, the other yeah. three chords. But if you hold it, you know, you can build up suspension and you know, you can manipulate your listener into becoming suspenseful with it. And you know, any moment you can do it. Now there's, there's arguably, that's arguably sort of breaking a rule of saying, well, the rules are the bass should move with the things, but then you go, but once you know those rules and you also know, that to sustain that bass will create something. And because the listener knows the rules as well, even though the listener might not be able to articulate the rule, they subconsciously know the rule is the bass should move. And so when you have those like drops building up in trance music, or whatever, it's because everyone universally in the, in the Western listener, ear right they all know what the bass line should be doing. So they were waiting for that moment. And so this idea of like, Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. So I can just do whatever I want. It's like, well, you can do whatever you want, but it will sound like shit. You can't, you, you have to have some rules. Yeah. You have to, you have to follow some rules like anything like filmmaking, you're a self taught filmmaker, but you can't just, just put together arbitrary images. It will just be shit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do, I, I do think that the, that going back to really briefly to that thing about the barrier to entry may, maybe one of the issues now is it, it's it's there's a lot of sample based light music and it's very easy to to um rely on samples and i think sometimes that can be it to the detriment of you teaching yourself like well you don't need to learn anything because you can just get this three chord riff yeah off um and so as if you've got music if you if the whole like music music if the audience's taste doesn't crave anything more than the three chord riff then you can get away with never having to learn anything like 20 years ago songs weren't three chord riffs that that's a new thing to just have a three chord i mean there were three chord riff songs but a lot of songs had like verse chorus mid late structures right yeah so even if you could find a three great three chord sample if you needed to progress beyond those three chords you wouldn't know what you're doing if you were, if you had no musical knowledge you'd be going right i need another three chord sample that sounds good after i just need a whole fucking song yeah just someone yeah. give me a whole song which they, they do you can you can download whole fucking song stems now which i, I know never crazy, quite understood. i'm like well everyone's got access to the same thing it doesn't make sense you're not but anyway yeah sorry i, think I went off on a rant there no 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 <laughs> no please do i like this it's great um and i think what you what you said there is i think when you have those three chords and then you realize i need something else that goes beyond that you probably come to the realization actually i should probably know a bit about how to write music um, well you can you can get this me. great idea starter it, it would be like like again to use analogy if you were like wanted to be a novelist it'd be like if they brought out a website where there were like story starters Right. And yeah. if you like download a pack of really cool opening fucking paragraphs, <laughs> and it was like great premises that we know we, anyone who's tried writing anything knows there's a big fucking distance between a great premise and a fully realized story. Like the idea of, you know, what if, what if uh, it's in the set of the future and s you spies could steal each other's memories. Oh, that sounds really cool. Yeah. What happens? What's the plot? Well, I don't, I don't know what the plot is that's a lot of yeah. work and effort and that's like with songs getting an idea started is one thing getting it to the to the finish line is a completely different beast yeah it, it, it's kind of um 
makes me think a bit about artificial intelligence. And I read stories every now and again, and I see bits and pieces about how um, artificial intelligence is being used to write music. And there was a piece, I did listen to a piece of music that was written by artificial intelligence, and it was very forgettable, admittedly. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how that, it might already be there. I know, I know, for example, you can upload things like, um, I'm not I'm not knocking Lander or anything like that, but you can upload your music to these sites and it uses machine learning i'm i believe to 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 master your music and other bits and pieces so it'd be interesting to see how the what the future holds in terms of songwriting with artificial intelligence like, i mean we've got we've got a kind of early the early kind of indicator of where create the creative world's going to get pulled by ai is this this dull dull e thing that everyone's trialing at the moment this ai you just write in a sentence and it will draw an image based on the sentence Ooh. This is this is already all over the internet. It's it's mm. not fully accessible to everyone, so it's in like beta. But you can. I saw one the other day that was like someone had typed in something like um, ancient Roman battle from the view of a GoPro, <laughs> and it had created this image that was like Roman centurions in central Rome all fighting, but all shot through like fisheye lenses as if someone was filming with a selfie stick. And wow. people can are writing in all kinds of things like. Um, there's people love to write things about like the apocalypse. It's like, it's it, it, they're kind of slightly painterly oil painting esque images, but the, you're already on the way to like, yeah, people no longer needing artists. They'll just be like typing in a thing. So it's music can't scary. be far behind, although I feel like music might be a hard enough for AI to crack, but yeah, I feel, I feel like, I think, I think like two only two or three years ago i was thinking well ai might be able to crack a load of shit but it's not going to replace creative roles mm. and now i'm like a little bit less confident about that prediction. yeah <laughs> it's scary isn't it i think with the with i mean quantum computing hasn't proliferated through everywhere yet and um i don't know if we'll be used in that particular context but computing power and artificial intelligence and machine learning i think you're right i think I mean, it depends what you want to do as a creative. I mean, I don't know if you'd call yourself a creative. If Imagine if you wanted to write a song, you're like, you know what? I need a song for my album. It needs to be, uh, I want it in a minor key or harmonic minor of some sort. It's, I want it to be sad. It's got to be about X, Y, Z. And something just creates it for you. Quite a scary thought. Um, I mean, on the, on the other hand, it, it's like, well, if, if you have this AI that creates this music from sort of sentence structure, sentence commands or instructions or mm. directing or whatever. On one hand, that seems like brilliant. And let's imagine we're in a future now where I can just say, make a funky eighties pop song in yeah, the style yeah, of the yeah. system or something like that. And it spits it out and it's exactly what I wanted. Unless the thing can do it again, exactly again and again, again, and, and create my identity. The identity of the music will be the, will be the AI's, brand identity not yours yeah, it will have because yeah. when you see all these ai images they all have the same distinctive look about them so on mm. one hand you might be going as an artist oh shit we're going to get replaced but on the other hand i'll be like but they all look the same no matter who's generating it they all have the same look and feel so i feel there'll be a there'll be a time where we'll be we'll be kind of going yeah that sounds ai that yeah. sounds that doesn't sound quite like a, like a there's the cat like i don't know I think it's a weird frontier and I yeah. don't care to project too much into the future. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's sort of like you move away from the, uh, not the arguments, wrong word, but where individuals say, well, that's analog, that's digital. And you move into the realm of, well, that's, that's, that's human and that's AI. Very interesting. And there's a website. It's a total tangent now, but I don't know if you've seen it. You can go on there and it's artificial intelligence has been used to create a human face that yeah, is I've seen it. totally unique. Well, and very, also or, um, Adobe's got like voice synthesis stuff where it can take a not, not much more than like 30 second sample of your voice. Yeah. And once it's done that, it learns your voice and then you could, I could type an essay and it would synthesize your voice and sound like wow. you've spoken it. So we're in like a brave new world with all that shit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. All, all of it is an evolution. It just becomes a more and more complicated evolution of the obsess obsession we all have over art, which is does the process matter? How you got from A to B, do we care about that? Do like, yeah. does it matter if the person cheated, whether they used samples or whether they made it all themselves? Like how, like, like how much does that matter? How much does anyone care? And I think as musicians, we all deeply care how someone's mm -hmm. got there. We'll feel like someone's cheating if they've used shortcuts or whatever. 
And then we get really annoyed when the audience doesn't know or give a shit. That's the thing is you want the audience to care. You want the fans to care and they don't know or give a shit how you got there. Yeah. They're sometimes impressed if you're really overtly doing something clever with a guitar or you're really obviously out. When it comes to like electronic music where there are new, no new physical musicians, they don't know whether you are, uh, you spent 10 years learning how to play Neo soul chord progressions, or whether you downloaded <laughs> Neo soul chord progressions off a MIDI pack in five seconds, they, they don't know or give a shit. And that's yep. the thing that's really annoying as a musician because you you feel like, well, surely hard work should be rewarded somewhere in this this you know equation. Surely this person's cheating. They should be at the back of the queue if they're going to download all their fucking sounds and I'm here making it all. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, it's um, that's what, I, what my question was going to be. What are your thoughts on that? And obviously, you just you've just sort of uh, mentioned those that. And it is it's, it's that, isn't it? As creators, we're very very sort of precious about the, the creative process and, and how our music's put together. But I think fundamentally, I know a lot of the music, a lot of the consumers are probably just listening to it through. The, this might be a very sweeping statement, but listening to it through their phone. Um, and there's that argument that like, you're not listening to it how I perceive it to be reproduced using, using a phone speaker. Um, yeah. And it's, it's because, like you say, they don't really care. They just want something that sounds good. How it got from A to B doesn't really matter to them. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say I'm anti, I'm not actually anti, I actually not, despite everything I've just said, anti like <laughs> using samples. I, I think they have a place in like, Really recently, I've been diving into loads of late '90s, early noughties, like iconic sample libraries, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm still massively into film music, and I'm kind of at the moment like low key obsessed with the 2001 soundtrack to Tomb Raider. There's on my Graham Revell, and he uses. Wow. I've discovered all the Spectrosonics samples that he used, and I was like going, "Oh my god, that is!" I thought that was like a fully like original bit of composition by Ravel, but it's not, it's a sample, but he did the score in 10 days. So it's, wow. so I don't, I, I still don't know what the exact backstory is. That was quite a legendary film composer called Michael Kamen. who was attached and at the very last minute. They, they, they got rid of him for some reason. And Graham Ravel was brought on board to score this movie, this Hollywood movie in 10 days. And so, and it's, you know, it's a, I'm sure you've seen the film, but it's, you know, it's got all this kind of ethnic mystic kind of spiritual, magical kind of vibe to it. And so actually when you go to, when you say, right, I need to, I need to evoke a sense of place. Ideally the quickest way to do this would be if I could just have like a fucking the Duke or a yeah. shak Shakuhachi fucking flute or something. <laughs> um, I don't have time to go out and record that <laughs> right now, find one of the world's best like Shakuhachi players. But what I do have are like these sample CD loops. So there's, you know, and he, he couldn't have got it done without samples. And sometimes, and, I, and I've no doubt that he might have even used some of those samples as the quick inspiration point. He's just there going, I don't have time to think I need to do a cue every fucking hour for this i need to write two and a half hours of music by the end of the week he was like in america and they were they had people over in uh, in london recording the orchestra and they're like overnight sending it via the highest speed internet wow. they had in 2001 but for me there's there's that moment of that's the kind of perfect symbiosis of where like tech is serving the the job and everyone's working kind of like I said, he's, 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 he probably was using those samples as inspiration. And you, yeah. you asked me like earlier about, no, you shouldn't ask me earlier. You, you, maybe you were going to ask me about a track I did called Night Swim. And that was the only, that's a track I've done where I was doing it for a job. I was asked to write it for a game trailer and I had like four days to write it, which now makes me feel, feel really embarrassed. Cause like Graham Revelle got a fucking film score done in 10 and, and I'm like, <laughs> Oh shit. Could I make a song in five days yeah. or something? But when you're under that pressure and you've got a really specific brief, there's a moment where you have to go into just some zone, mm. the zone, like the complete full intuition zone. You do not have time to go like back and second guess it and try out loads of ideas. You kind of almost just got to go first idea that vaguely starts to work intuitively fucking hit, go with it and run with it. That's um, that, that, that brings us on to a nice segue uh, actually to it, which was going to be my next question, which is about the creative process. Um, and I like the idea that you mentioned, because it's something that comes up a lot in these, in these interviews with regards to 
deadlines and goals and you give yourself four days and it's almost like you have that um you have those time pressures and those constraints that forces you to use what you have rather than spend that time ex experimenting would be nice but sometimes i don't know about you but some of the best stuff i've probably come up with has been when i've been given a brief or i've been given a, a set time and i've just got to get i've just got it my my door is a sketch pad and i'm going to get something down using what i have um so it kind of moves on nicely to the next question which is when it does come to songwriting and your compositional process how does that generally start? Um, do you uh, have an idea before you sit down or do you just sit down and think, right, I'm going to come up with something today? I, I think I generally start with a, with a sort of vague, at least a vague kind of sense of the, 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 the vibe of the genre, the, the, the kind of what my, what, what kind of track am I, do I feel like making or want to make or what have you. And, and sometimes I might, if it's a hyper specific thing, I might have listened to some other piece of music and gone, Oh man, that's fucking brilliant. I want to write something a bit like that. Yeah. I do that So sometimes, time. sometimes I'm kind of not, not, in, not copying, but I am, in, I'm, I'm, I'm going in with a very, with a very kind of clear agenda for like, I want to make something that sounds like that. Um, and sometimes it could be, I'm, I'm a firm believer of improvisation as well. Sometimes you could just be noodling on, you know, the piano and improvising and something comes out of it where you're like, Oh shit, that's good. Fuck, I better record that. And then you might build something around it. So, um, but I think having that mentally, having that roadmap in your head before you set out going, at least if it's at least kind of, okay, I want to make a mid upbeat kind of cool, um, sultry 80s inspired synth pop track that might have a female vocal or something cool on it and i want it to sound a little bit like that track i just heard or this or have that atmosphere and and that sort of thing i think that that already gives you a lot of inf like a lot of kind of next steps in what you're going to do um and largely i would i i generally start with a chord sequence i feel like there's kind of I sometimes if I, if I have some very specific, like rhythmic idea in my head, I might start with drums, but I, I gen generally will put down like a very basic drum kit just so I'm not working to a click track. And then the yeah. next, the thing that I will spend the most time on before I move on will be chord sequences because for me, they're like the foundations and it's, it's too tempting. To, to move away from chord sequences that you haven't got nailed and start yeah. fucking around with drums or ear candy and things like that, hoping you're going to get, that's going to save you from having not really come up with a song, but it depends on what, depends on what you're making. Cause most of what I do is, is are like song songs. I, mean, I make instrumental stuff as well, but they're, they're songs with verses and pre choruses and choruses and middle eights and things like that. Yeah. Um, and you, and like, so you, like, it's not, it's, it's very much about the chord sequences. And so, you know, you could, so there's an amount of times I've got a great, like three chord idea. And I'm going, this is really, oh, this is great. I cannot work out where the fuck this goes after that. <laughs> and that's kind of everything. All you, and it comes back to what I said before, all you've got is a great movie premise. Yeah. You've got a great opening scene. But what do you, what is happening? What is the actual plot? Where is this thing going? You need at least like for a great pop song. I mean, no, I say now, for, nowadays for a great pop song, you need three chords. But if you're going to go beyond that, really, if you can have a song that comprises of at least three different chord sequences that are all equally as catchy, that's when you, that's when you can, you know, that's when you've got something. Although, some songs I've written that have been popular have been literally three chords, <laughs> having just said that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's really good advice. I think starting with the chords because um, I follow a similar process myself. Um, and I've, I've fallen into the trap previously where I've got uh, two or three chords, or not even a chord, sometimes it's a bass line. And then I think, right, I'll get some drums on this. And I spend hours just come up with these elaborate drum patterns um, and admittedly uh, i'm not a, a drummer not that that's an excuse but drum programming is not um a friend of mine a lot of the time 
Um, so I try not to spend too much time on it. But yeah, I, I've done that. And I think you're right in, in chord progressions and that. So w w when you do have a chord progression, and you mentioned there about the fact that you're stuck for an idea, how do you overcome that? Or do you just sort of put it to the side, move on to something else and come back to it? Um, I mean, just, just to say, pause for a moment and say, starting with the bass lines, not, I mean, I've actually, I mean, I have it on, a, I've had conversations with my mum, go back to being a classically trained musician, where mm -hmm. she's often actually emphasised that actually starting with a bass line isn't a bad way to go because, and even starting, and starting with a melody is also a great way to go because if you've got a great bass line, it kind of dictates what the chord sequence will be. So the chord sequence will emerge from the bass line. Uh, but then you're still into the next, if you're planning to do anything more than a three or two chord wonder, then you're like, okay, do I have to come up with now another really fucking good bass line to progress it to the next <laughs> yeah. bit, Or now I've got to come up <laughs> with the next bit. But I, I guess um, that's again, where some of it, the kind of rules and things can come into play where, um, I suppose it would depend, it depends on what that starting chord progression is. And I think sometimes like a, what feels like a really instinctively like hooky chord progression, you can mentally think this is the verse. And then you suddenly realize actually this would be better as the chorus. And I need to come up with something less exciting almost <laughs> to yeah. be my verse to build up to this chorus and kind of go, okay, so this is the main, this is the main bit. So now I need to think of what would precede this, what would be coming before it that would build up to it. And I guess there are like some rules around if you've got a chord sequence that's going, I'm not name chords, let's just call them numbers, one, two, three. You know that an, a chord sequence following at three, two, one wouldn't work because you've have chords three and three next to each other. So they yeah. wouldn't be the satisfying moving from one chord to another, which are things that I can hear when people I was saying to you before we started this chat about when people share their music online and ask for feedback in like forums oh, with yeah, producers yeah. and things, people will often ask that question of like, why aren't my transitions hitting or, and then everyone feels in like there's a, there's a, there's the answer must lie somewhere in the ma magical mystery of the mix and not in like, yes, there's song, there's sound choices. Yes. You could jazz it up with white noise and effects, and maybe you could make a better drum fill. And there's lots of things to do with the mix that could be improved, but st strip all that back. Fundamentally, the reason that this, this isn't landing is because you've got two chord progressions going next to each other that aren't working or, or basically you've never got out of that one chord progression. So yeah. you want it to kind of go somewhere and it's not going anywhere because harmonically it's not going anywhere, not because there's some failure in your mix or everything. And I think because there's so many self-taught musicians now these days, the advice everyone gives falls back to mix advice because no one mm. knows how to articulate, including myself, especially in writing on like Facebook comments or Instagram comments. Yeah, yeah. No one really knows how to articulate it. And also you're talking to someone who might not understand what you're saying, even if you could articulate it. Yeah. So the conversations become around, man, yeah, try making like the bass hit a bit more, maybe give it a notch <laughs> in the so and so or try and do this with the snare and do that. And yeah. I'm like, all good advice, but the thing they really need to do is go back to the basics of composition and go get your chord sequences sorted and then worry about all the other surrounding confetti and stuff because you're just trying to kind of jazz up something that's not there. It's just yeah. not there as an idea. Yeah. It's kind of like a, I know there is a, an international audience for this, but it's kind of like a purse out of a sales ear, I think is the phrase that we use in the Southwest a lot. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can like, you can make amazing tracks out of three chords mm. and, and especially if, especially if like, and again, that goes back to the knowing the rules to break the rules thing. If you're like, I am knowingly making a three chord loop where I'm really going to find this really brilliant three chord hook that I'm just going to really like, I really know how to build on this. And I mean, you know, dance music does that so well. Um, but yeah, to answer your question about sometimes it is just knowing when to just leave it and go, just leave that. I'm going to go mad trying to fix that 
in this one session trying to figure out what's next. Sometimes it's going, having the discipline as Robert De Niro was saying, heat to walk away from like the idea <laughs> of the Great discipline film. to walk away. Um, and sometimes it's about actually just going, do you know what? Just keep fucking powering through yeah. and break the back of this and do not resist the temptation to start noodling around with drums and fucking other sounds, hoping that's going to save you. Just do the fucking hard work because then the fun can begin. Once you've got that structure down, there's nothing more satisfying for me as going, there's my verse, there's my pre-chorus, there's the chorus, there's verse two, pre-two, chorus, middle eight, final chorus, and I've got all the chord sequences down and the bass is down. And now I can start looking at how I can, what other things I can add into that to make that interesting. But yeah, no, yeah. sit back going, the heart, the horrible part is over with. The hard part is the, is the chord sequence <laughs> and the bass line. That's how I always think. I was like, until I've got that chord sequence nailed, I can't, I can't like, I don't know. But I'm, I trying to be, that, I'm trying to be easier on myself lately. I'm trying yeah. to go easier and just, just, just live with doing three chord wonders. And I think that's great advice though. I love the idea of just getting the chords that I'm powering through because it's something I'm guilty of. And I'm sure the audience listening is as well. We get to a point where I'm like, it's not, it's probably not because the song's not working. It's just because I'm just not, I, I give up too easy maybe, but I think you're right. I think you just got power through sometimes and get those chords and those bass down. And, um, and, and, and also singing along is underrated as a, as a means to help mm. you coming up with those chord sequences. So even if you don't, you're not a singer, uh, or you're not planning to be the voice on the record, or you know that if you w get somebody else to sing on it, you know that their top line is not going to sound like yours, or you're not planning to tell them what to sing. But the amount of times I'm sitting at a piano going, I got a nut, I a nut, I because that can <laughs> sort of help you go, well, if the melody were doing that, where would that now go? If it's like, yeah. Da, 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 like that. Even if that's not what ends up being it. It's I having like a sort of some sort of melodic roadmap in your head. Mm. Otherwise you're just flying completely blind with no sense of what this could sound like. So it's always worth just kind of making up your own top line, even if it's just going to help you stay in the moment and go, okay, well, where would this go? This would go dun, 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 like that. And I'm scatting a load of shit. You yeah. Know? And but sometimes I will, if I work with a singer, I might go, this is sort of what I had in mind. And I might send them a guide track and it's me like going, oh, baby. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet you can make a whole album off of that. There's probably like yeah, all these yeah. artists somewhere. They can pull it, pull it all together and have this sunglasses kid <laughs> scatting album. Exactly. <laughs> I'd love to hear that. This, this kind of moves on. I'm, I'm well aware of time here. We're almost at the hour, but I, I kind of want to get this question in there. Um, so you mentioned there about working with artists and sending um tracks across um and and top lining so one of your um one of my favorite tracks of yours is your collaboration with ollie ride which is strange love which is um i think it's got what two million plus views on youtube now on new retro wave i um, think so yeah 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 i'm big on spotify as well so um just a bit of a, a story behind that collaboration and how that started it might be um yeah yeah be, be, be great um yeah so i I, I heard Ollie singing on FM 84's Running in the Night. Oh, I actually great, heard so. it in weird context. I was on a boat in Amsterdam and heard his voice. I was like, funny, oh, this is a good song. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and I reached out to Ollie over the course of the next year via DMs and bugging him in all kinds of ways and saying, we, you know, I'd love to do something with you with no, and sending him kind of different ideas and things, mainly kind of upbeat, funky stuff. And then, um, we actually met and I, I met him backstage at a show he was doing in London. And then, um, in the end, I kind of, we, we kind of, for various reasons, we didn't progress the conversation around collaborating together. But what I had been doing a lot of was just posting little ideas that I was having musical ideas on social media, particularly like Instagram. And I had just come up with, and it's such an about face way of doing it, but it's an interesting inspiration story, I suppose, in that. I was literally getting really into posting visuals from random like eighties movies. Mm. And I almost had found like this really random, like Jennifer Connelly movie from like 1985 that I just loved the visuals. So I like cut together this little minute video and almost went, I oh, kind of, this needs some sort of, I'm going to quickly write a piece of music just to 
have an excuse to share this Jennifer Connelly video. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just came up with this three chord, and it was almost like an experiment in how quickly can I write a synthwave-esque piece of music. So I quickly wrote these these three chords and put uh, like a arpeggiating Korg Poly 6 bass under it, a bit of sidechain compression, and a few bells, and I had a tape um, saturation emulator called Satin that could do some pitch warping stuff, warped a few of the bells to make it sound a little bit retro, posted it, and Ollie commented on it going, oh, I like this. We should do something with this. And I was like messaging him going, do you, are you serious? Cause right now it is literally, <laughs> that is it. it is that three chord loop. And he was, he was all about like less is more. And he, we, we then kind of worked on it together. And the, 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 the one section we couldn't quite, it was the one moment where we had a, not a disagreement, but a little bit of a discussion about how it should sound was we'd come up with a middle eight section and I'd come up with this chords variation that Ollie sang over and he was doing something completely different to what's in the final track. He was doing this very like chilled out kind of, he was always doing these little la la's. He was like, ha ha stranger love. And I yeah. was like, no, nah. I was like, no, you're Ollie Ryder. We need the fucking big, Wah! Like, we yeah, need a yeah, massive yeah. thing. And, um, he was like, okay, well, I'm not sure the chord sequence is working. Do you mind if I kind of have a muck about with it? And he slightly rearranged the chord sequence. So actually the middle eight section is, is kind of truly co-written by me and Ollie. Cause he actually inputted on the chord sequence. And I was like, fine. Cause then he did a top line that is the top line that you hear on the track. And I was like, well, if it gets us there, that's what I wanted the result to be was this massive epic crescendo leading us into the final chorus, not some timid kind of lull in it, in yeah, energy, yeah. which it was at the time. And so he then, I then brought that chord sequence back into Cubase on my end and we worked on it. And it was probably the most collaborative I've ever been with someone in terms of us backing and forthing and sharing ideas. Cause usually I give the track away to a singer, sit back, cross my fingers and hope they come back with something good. That's why I I, I'm very unprescriptive. I'm not a fan of telling people what to do. I think mm. it, 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 it's telling them how to write and what to do. And it's very limiting for them and annoying and unless you're going to kind of prescribe it exactly and hire them out like a session singer and pay them a flat rate fee. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how it came about. And I think, I think at the time it was the one time where I thought, I'm not saying it was a hit, but it was the one time where I had the sense of this is, this is good. Right. We were like, this is quite good, isn't it? Yeah. We're like, I don't know if anyone's going to like this like that much, but we're like, it's quite catchy, isn't it? I remember playing it to my mom and saying, this is, this is the one, isn't it? I'm like, if I've got, a, if I've made a track that's like any good, this one's pretty cool. And my mum is, you know, incredibly high, like uh, standards. She was like, yeah, I, yes, I really like this one. This one, this one's the one. Um, <laughs> and so that's like, it, yeah, it was, but what's interesting about that is that that was, that is largely a three chord wonder with some slight variations in it. But it was, I think that was my lesson in kind of going, you know, sometimes simpler is better. And I think I often make things too busy and don't leave enough room for vocalists. And that's something I'm always trying to kind of get better at doing. But yeah, that yeah. sort of echoes is, is an episode I did a few, few weeks ago, which was pretty much exactly that, which was, it was a reflection on a song that I released. And my reflection was that sometimes less is more. Um, and that, I, it was, the composition was just too, there was too much going on. And it was a, it was a pig to mix purely because I just tried to cram so much stuff in there. And sometimes it is a case of specifically with the vocals as well, like just, just stripping it back. And it's an approach that I'm going to take going forward. So I think that's really good for the audience to hear, um, is, is, is that. And I know from that episode, that previous one, I've had a, a few people mention that exactly that to me. And they, they've been sort of like, Mark, I released this track. I took the approach of less is more. And I'm like, it sounds great. Um, yeah. so it's, it's really cool to hear and it is a banging track as well, man. And, and the hats off to you. It's so good. <laughs> so, so on, good. Well, thank you. I mean, on the other hand, I'm also throw everything at a fucking track. I put in as many cowbells <laughs> and orchestral <laughs> hits and slap bass and stupid shit as I can and funky plucks and things like that. And that has its place as well. But I think, I think yeah. definitely if you are, com if you are very confident, you want a vocal on something. I think there is a lot to be said for being sure you carve out the space for that vocal and. And I think, I think it's more appealing to, to vocalists and the amount of times if I've sent an instrumental over that has an, in, has a melody on it, even if in your head, 
it's a counter melody. So in your head, you've got, you're envisaging a top line running over this thing and the melody you've got going on is like, would be a counter melody or something. The amount of times a vocalist will latch onto that melody and, and start kind of using that as a guide and coming back with a top line that's like just copying that melody. Mm. So actually sometimes not having too many melodic things happening in a track can kind of give people space, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, balancing that between presenting someone some I, i'm often presenting someone saying right now it's kind of this is half the track there, there'll be more stuff we'll add on but i feel now we need to get your vocal in work out what that's happening with the top line and then maybe put decoration around it depending on what's going on with that top line afterwards so sometimes you've got to kind of back and forth a bit with the singer yeah yeah i like that idea of carving out space for the vocal and i think you're exactly right there um and i think it's something the audience can take away in 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 their own productions which is amazing um ed i'm, re I'm well aware we're, we're well over an hour now so um i've, well, I've got for england i told no, you to control me <laughs> no no it's great i mean well i've got well, one two questions one of them is you mentioned there about the bass line the funky bass line yeah i've seen some of your 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 well, I've listened to your music and I've seen the, the shorts that you put on, on reels, etc. What are you using to create those slap basses? What are you using? Because it's, <laughs> it sounds so good. Um, I mean, depends which, which sound you're referring to. I mean, a lot of the bass, a lot of the bass on my fur on graduation and quite a bit of, um, uh, can't sophomore. hide. That's the one. And, I'm and, and can't, can't hide yet. Yeah, can't, so can't hide is, the Korg Poly Six, ah, so it's the right. same. It's the same. I'll, I'll, I'll even give everyone the exact preset because it's so <laughs> it's so it's so like syn um, synonymous with synthwave. Everyone's a lot of people were using it, but not in the way I use it. So it's the it's literally the preset is called Fat Line Bass, okay. and it's this really like chorusy kind of bass preset. And then the trick is to short is to make is get the, the length just right. So it's making it very um, fast attack and short um, release. And yeah, um, so it's playing it quite it's, it's playing it in a very percussive way. Yeah. And then you can you can either like layer another slap bass sound, which slap bass is I'm getting from like Korg M1. Korg Triton, Triton yeah. VST or Wave Station. Wave Station's all over my first album um and you can either you could either literally like have literally an exact layer copy of the melody but on a slap bass going over it or you could do choice slaps like every like just accent slaps yeah but what i'm doing with the slap bass is i'm carving out all the low end so you've just got the top end slap information so if you just solo the slap bass it's like ping, ping, ping. it doesn't sound like a bass but once it's laid over that percussive poly six stabbing bass sound especially if you're doing choice accents so you have yeah that's the one on the bass then on the slap you could be doing these little choice notes or you could be kind of doing it all so that's how you so it's nothing like just a tiny little spiking on the slap could just create the illusion that there's a slap bass going on somewhere in the mix yeah. and you can dial that in and out levels wise to your kind of taste or whatever and make it either a really big feature or just knock it in every so often no yeah, i love that's that that's how i'm doing it <laughs> fantastic all right well, I, I, I knew there was a core game one in there somewhere at some point and i am the, the poly i i'm going to investigate so my, my final question for you mm. is, so, so we, there's a podcast community group and i put it put it in there that i'm interviewing um and uh and also if anybody had any questions. So, uh, there's, uh, there's, um, uh, one of the listeners called Reese Hayward. He says, um, you enjoy using sounds from both eighties and nineties, mm. but which is your favorite decade for music? If you had to pick one. Oh shit, man. Yeah. <sighs> there you go. Put you on the spot there. I, I love both. I think. Oh, probably. Oh God, I really like both of them. <laughs> Pro probably the eighties. Yeah. But, but I do like, there's a lot of great songs in the nineties. And I think, I think what I like, what I think that's for people who are like, love both eras and are thinking about like, how can you kind of fuse the two? The answer lies in around 1998, 1989 to about 1993. 
mm. you can hear the crossover because it's like this people think that decades when one decade ends suddenly at exactly the end of the decade the new decade <laughs> yeah. comes in the entirely new sound and new fashion and everything comes in it doesn't work like that so at least for the first three years of the next decade 19, 1990 to 1994 but virtually is still the 80s in terms of the yeah, sound yeah, and the yeah. ideas and shit so you can hear if you start if you were really interested in studying that kind of how you can fuse those two sounds that's that's the the, the secret source is hidden in like 1990 1991 I like and then that. it's about finding those genres that are doing what you lo- you're interested in so going like the one thing i love doing is going back and listening to what jazz musicians were doing in the 80s because some of them are just doing still what sounds like regular jazz but then it's sometimes you'll discover a gold mine being like holy shit miles davis did a load of freak out shit in like 1985 with those drum machines and synths <laughs> and stuff and you just tap into this unknown like gold mine of wacky things and you can find that in the early 90s as well with different genres or so tangented uh, there but yeah no no i love um, it no that's 80s, brilliant let's say 80s is the best yeah, I like, I, like, I like that idea. Um, I, I don't know why I like the idea, but what, what, what you mentioned there about like when the 80s ends and the 90s begins, you use this whole thought process that it's a new decade, so everything is new. Um, there's no yeah, transition. it doesn't work like that. But no, what, you no, can, exactly. what you can hear, I guess, it's at the at the end, the end, the beginning of a new decade or the end of an end of a decade is arguably where the most kind of the sounds and ideas are really bedded in. So by like, it's, 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 it's most experimental at the start of the decade as new ideas and things have been explored, but everyone hasn't got too comfortable with it yet. So like 88, 89, the eighties is at its most peak. Every eighties mm-hmm. idea is synthesized into kind of pop and it really knows what it's doing as a sound. And then early nineties, as it's trying to introduce and invent new sounds, you've got this weird hinterland of like genres where no one's quite sure what's going on. And that can be a really interesting kind of place to dive into and explore yeah. and familiarize yourself with. Food for thought. No, brilliant. Thank you for that. So, um, Ed, Sunglasses Kid, where, where can our audience, if they haven't heard of you, um, which I'm sure they have, uh, where can they find you online? Where's the best place to go? Uh, best place to go is probably Instagram, at Sunglasses Kid Music, um, or you can help me grow my nascent TikTok on also <laughs> at Sunglasses Kid Music um, or uh, at Twitter, at Sunglasses Kids. But mainly I'm active on Instagram and TikTok. I'm at That's Sunglasses nice. Kid Music because Sunglasses Kid was taken on TikTok already by someone. No. And Instagram, I think I might have managed to lock myself out of my own handle. I think I got Sunglasses <laughs> Kid and then did some major <laughs> fail and I can't claim it back. So there is actually Sunglasses Kid out on Instagram that is just a ghost account that I think I might even own, but will be locked wow. out of it forever. Nice. Anyway, yeah. Um have you got any key dates or anything coming up that you want to share? I put you on the spot here. I didn't actually prime you for this question. Do you know what? I do not. I don't. I, I'm right now. I'm focused very much on some sort of behind the scenes stuff, doing some working with other producers, doing a bit cool. of ghostwriting. I am doing some moving and shaking with some people. Um, I will try and get an album out in 2023 because I seem to operate Lovely. in these three year cycles. But um, there is nothing imminently on the horizon i mean i just dropped an ep and i just dropped a single um called totally which is kind of more of my kind of 80s 90s pop funky candy fair or if you want that kind of slower jam soundtracky ethereal stuff my recent ep called um nightlife uh, exploring some late 80s early 90s kind of ambient trippy That's sound awesome. so you can check that out as well love it thank you thank you so much for spending the time with me today Cheers. It's, uh, it's, it's great i've been i've been eager to, to get you on here for, for a while now because I, like I, said, I follow your music and i follow your your posts and stuff you put oh, online thanks. and your creative processes so it's fantastic to to hear and your your thoughts and takes on i know we didn't get quite through everything we wanted to but it's one of those ones with the no one can with me <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Talk too much. It, 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 it never happens with these hopefully, episodes to be fair hopefully there's um, some vague 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 nuggets in there maybe we have to have me out uh, back for part two no i would love to i'd love to have you back and uh, i know we were chatting off air about you giving demonstrations of how you're how you create a track so i think it'd be fantastic to get you back on we'll see if we can nail that share. tech to yeah. try and figure we've, we've got the screen we've got the picture share bit nailed we yeah, just need yeah. to figure out the audio share bit and then we. i can think that would be fantastic fun. to do absolutely brilliant well yeah big thank you again ed for joining me today and because I, I know it's late now i'll leave you to enjoy the rest of your evening pleasure cheers you too cheers buddy bye